Ladies and gentlemen, the following segment of the podcast is presented exclusively by Hillsdale College. For over 175 years, four purposes have defined Hillsdale's mission, learning, character, faith, and freedom. Thank you for listening and my sincere appreciation to our brothers and sisters at Hillsdale for their great sponsorship. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin. Our number is 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. Yes, there's a lot going on, but let me start with this. Let me try to unravel what's happened in the last hour. What is success in Afghanistan? The Pentagon brass, soon the Secretary of State, tomorrow the President of the United States... They're going to be very careful, their media handlers, not to act like they're spiking the ball. But they want you to know that this was a tremendous success. 122, 123, 124,000 evacuated from Afghanistan. That the war went on long enough. And we needed to put an end to it. And so this was successful. This was a disaster. And it is a disaster. Any way you look at it. A complete and utter disaster. And it is getting a little troubling. With these correspondents at the Pentagon and correspondents in Washington starting to regurgitate the narrative that's being given to them. I have a question that nobody's asked and it's been bothering me. Have any American citizens already been killed by the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or ISIS? And if so, how many the last three weeks? Nobody asks. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Well, isn't that the key? How many American citizens, if any, have been killed in the last three weeks? How many have been taken hostage in the last three weeks? The State Department, repeated by the Pentagon brass, repeated by the spokes at the White House, say almost with absolute certitude there's about 250 Americans left. All of a sudden, 15,000, 11,000, 6,500. Now we've gotten 6,000 out. We know of 250 if they want to come out. It's like, wait a minute. You're throwing an awful lot of numbers at us. Do you know if any American citizens have already been killed over the course of the last several weeks, or how many may have been killed over the course of the last several weeks, or how many have been taken hostage, they have no idea. Or if they do, just tell us. None. The way the narrative now is also being directed is, if you criticize what Biden and the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor have done, you're criticizing the United States military. Now, these are the people in the Biden administration that have always hated the military and are flatlining their budget. Teaching them critical race theory and concern about all the white supremacists who are among them, remember? Nobody that I know of who's criticizing Biden and his top generals and the State Department and so forth is criticizing the United States military. Quite on the contrary. Success. At what? Thirteen. Thirteen American personnel, military personnel, were killed in one suicide attack. That's 13 more than the past 18 months combined. And it's the most in a single day since a decade ago. Is that success too? I'm just curious. What exactly was the mission here? The estimate is there are 80,000 special 
visa holders who didn't get out. Now, why are they special visa holders? Because we gave them special visas. Why? Because they worked extremely closely with the United States military and our allies to fight the Taliban. Approximately 80,000, give or take. They're still there. Their families are still there. We've heard the stories. We've seen the first-hand witnesses on TV telling us what's happening to many of them. Certainly some of them. No? Then you hear, I heard somebody on cable, the war is over. The war is over. The war is not over. What war is over? Maybe our physical presence in Afghanistan is over. The war is not over. We weren't at war in Afghanistan when they hit us the first time. Al-Qaeda. Based in Pakistan and a specific location in Afghanistan. We hadn't attacked them at all. So the war is not over, certainly not in their eyes, and if it's over in our eyes, we're doomed. And there's different kinds of wars, different kinds of strategies, different kinds of tactics. You must be a warmonger. No, I'm a peace lover, actually. A peace lover. Now, they moved my show to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Fox because they wanted to cover the hurricane. Perfectly understandable. The only thing that confused me, quite frankly, was there was more going on with the hurricane at 10 p.m. Eastern Time than at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. But that's fine. I get it. I had on Congressman Brian Mast, and I had on Congressman Dan Crenshaw. I believe that they are veterans, combat veterans, who fought in Afghanistan. One lost both his legs and an index finger. The other one lost an eye, and his other eye is it's giving him a hell of a big problem. Ask them if they think this was a success. I can understand General McKenzie. His job was, but once all hell broke loose, to get our troops out there by August 31 and as many people as we can who come to the gate. Some who didn't come, but most had to come to the gate. How many stories have you heard who people who went to the gate and couldn't get in? And you should have seen my, my iPhone yesterday. The texts that I was getting from people telling me about other people who were at the gates. They couldn't get in. Students who couldn't get in. I said, who do you want me to call? I'll do whatever you want. And then... I got a text. It's over. Forget it. Nobody's allowed in. Is that success? Is that success? There are no American media in Afghanistan today. There will be no Western media in Afghanistan. The genocide that's going to take place will not be on your television screens... You won't hear the screams of the women being raped. You won't hear the screams of the little girls being grabbed from their parents. You're not going to hear the screams of families, one after another, watching as they're decapitated because they assisted the United States, or as they lop off hands and lop off legs and lop off arms. That's the Taliban, the newly reformed Taliban. You won't hear any of it, and you won't see any of it. Success. Success. That's none of our business, Mark. Those people helped us. We didn't go there to help them, certainly not originally. We went there to settle a score and to try and make sure this wouldn't happen again from Afghanistan. Those people helped us. But Mark, we got 122, 123, 124,000. And if I heard carefully what the general said... Actually, we got out, I think it was 80, 85, 90,000. And our partners got out the others. Obviously, they couldn't do it without us. And I'm not trying to put anyone down. I happen to think that's a remarkable thing. But it was a surrender. It was a surrender. That's what it was. 
and 13 of our fellow Americans died, and hundreds if not thousands of our fellow Americans are behind enemy lines. And tens of thousands of our allies, the Afghans, are behind enemy lines. And now you're going to hear them tough talk about the Taliban. We're going to use diplomacy. A hundred nations are with us. We got money. We're going to withhold money. Now, these are people who've never had money. Well, now they have to run a country. They're not going to run a country like... You know, it's me. They say, you can't set up Jeffersonian democracy. They're right. Not in Afghanistan. We did throughout Europe under the Marshall Plan, but not in Afghanistan. I got it. But then they act like the Taliban are going to create a Jefferson. You know, they want their banks. They want the money. They got to run the airport. They got to, they got to satisfy the people. They got, Wait a minute. They're terrorists. They want Lee kill. So that's not the case. We watch people being turned back from that wall, from the gates. We watch them. And what else? Well, more when I return. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. American history and civics education is at a turning point. Will we allow bureaucrats and lobbyists to choose what school children are taught, or will we teach the whole truth? Now, my friends at Hillsdale College argue for teaching the truth. They've made the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum downloadable for free at levinforhillsdale.com. Available not only to teachers, but also to citizens like you to share with other concerned citizens. This complete K-12 through history and civics curriculum, designed to give educators guidance, not mandates, allows students to learn the tragedies and triumphs of American history as it really happened. Our children deserve to be taught the truth through a sound curriculum that was created by teachers, not bureaucrats, and upholds the dignity of each individual. America's future depends upon an honest, candid look at our history. Download Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum for free today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. Ninety retired generals and admirals have called for Millie and Austin to resign. You won't hear from a single one of them on the corrupt media. Not one. And on August 19th, Joe Biden said, remember, if there's, an Amer- if there's American citizens left, meaning on August 31, we're going to stay to get them all out. That's what he told Stephanopoulos. We're not. And John Kirby this morning was asked a question, too. The mouthpiece over at the Pentagon, cut three, go. A number of us have gotten reports from either American citizens or uh, vulnerable Afghans that are still on the ground and can't get through the gates anymore. They've been got, getting notices that the evacuation is over. Um, what happens next for those that are left behind? Will there be any sort of military operation to help get them out of the country? I think you heard Secretary Blinken talk about this, that uh, for... Uh, for Americans uh, and and other individuals that uh, that want to be able to leave Afghanistan after our withdrawal is complete, that uh, the State Department is going to continue to work uh, across many different levers uh, to facilitate that transportation. I, and as I say, I say, as I said earlier. Right now, we do not anticipate a military role in that effort. No, not a military role. Biden said we're going to keep the military there until we get our citizens out. No, we're going to have a State Department role. I'm sure that will really influence the terrorists in Afghanistan. Well, why didn't you start evacuations earlier? Because this is such a tremendous, tremendous historical success. Cut four, go. You were essentially stopped by the State Department from beginning those evacuations. I, I wouldn't say that, and I don't think it's uh, important right now to get into internal deliberations. No, let's not get into internal deliberations. It's time to click our wine glasses, because you see, we got out. Go ahead. We were obviously still in close contact with the Ghani government, which was still, you know, he was still the president uh, of the country. And, um, you, you know, you, you have to have you have to be able to have those conversations, too, because our expectation was that 
the Ghani government would stay in no, place? No, we now have intel and we also have emails from people who were actually on the ground there who said they felt that the that the military would would quickly uh, would quickly uh, unravel. And particularly when you uh, you leave the biggest air base you have in the middle of the night and you don't tell them. So let's be clear. The actions of the Biden generals and the Biden administration in part contributed in significant part to the Afghan army deteriorating. The way that they took the steps that they took. So is the Taliban, is it less safe now, now that it has all of our weapons? Cut nine, go. Are Americans less safe now because the Taliban now has access to billions of dollars worth of American-made weaponry? Well, let me unpack your question a little bit because please, uh, the please. U.S. military, part of their retrograde effort is to... Facilitate, retrograde, unpack. Go ahead. Reduce the amount of military equipment or apparatus that uh, anyone on the ground has access to. I'm not going to get into the details of how they do that, but that is part of their effort. I will also uh, reiterate something that, that our national security advisor said just last week. We had to make an assessment several weeks ago about whether we provide materials to the Afghan national security forces so that they could fight the fight. Obviously, they decided not okay, to. Okay, okay, okay. That's not the question, is it? Is it, ladies and gentlemen? It's not the question. This is a huge success, I thought. The question is, they collapsed. You pulled the rug out from under them. You left all our weapons there. Are we now safer as a result? The answer is no. In fact, we're we're in much, much more grave and serious danger than we were before this spectacular withdrawal, historic withdrawal. We've never seen anything like this before in world history. And it wouldn't have been necessary, at least not to this extent and not this way, had Biden not been president. Had Austin not been Secretary of Defense. Had Blinken not been Secretary of State. Sherman not been National Security Advisor, and on and on. How much time, Rich? All right, when we come back, since we now know the military is not going to lift a finger, according to Admiral Communications Director Kirby, who was also a communications director in the Obama administration. All the retreads are back. So the military is not going to lift a finger now at the order of the commander of the chief uh, to use any uh, military assets to get our citizens out when it wasn't that long ago. Twelve days ago, when Joe Biden said on ABC News, we're going to stay till we get them all out. I want to continue with this. I'll be right back. American history and civics education is at a turning point. Will we allow bureaucrats and lobbyists to choose what school children are taught? Or will we teach the whole truth? Now, my friends at Hillsdale College argue for teaching the truth. They've made the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum downloadable for free at levinforhillsdale.com. Available not only to teachers, but also to citizens like you to share with other concerned citizens. This complete K-12 through history and civics curriculum, designed to give educators guidance, not mandates, allows students to learn the tragedies and triumphs of American history as it really happened. Our children deserve to be taught the truth through a sound curriculum that was created by teachers, not bureaucrats, and upholds the dignity of each individual. America's future depends upon an honest, candid look at our history. Download Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum for free today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. Liberty's Voice, Mark Levin. Talk with that voice now, 877-381-3811. I just want to continue with the long list of successes uh, that took place during the last several weeks of the Biden surrender. Richard Engel is a reporter. He's actually quite liberal. His father was quite liberal. He was a reporter, too, but it doesn't matter. He's NBC chief foreign correspondent. He was on MSNBC today with Andrea Mitchell, who's also a liberal. Well, what did they have to say? Cut 13, go. 
This is a critical time, obviously, to get both the U.S. personnel and the equipment out of Afghanistan, blow up the equipment that's left. What is the latest? What happens after the deadline if the U.S. cannot get every Afghan who wants to leave out, which is now obviously going to happen? We're talking about thousands of people. Oh, there's no possible way at this stage that the U.S. is going to get everyone out who wants to leave or who may have changed their mind uh, and uh, has decided that they now want to uh, to go and don't want to ride it out with the Taliban. Uh, we're in the final hours. All right, now. that's it. Now, why are we in the final hours? Because Biden set August 31, and the Taliban said, that's right, that's our red line. That's it. So American citizens who want to get out cannot get out. And the military is not going to help them get out. The military is done. That's what Admiral Kirby said at the Pentagon today. It's now up to the State Department. And we all know the Taliban shivers when it hears about the Secretary of State, Binken, What happens to the Afghans that are left behind? Now, we know what happens, right? But here's Matt Bradley, NBC News foreign correspondent, on the Morning Schmo Show. And by the way, the Morning Schmo thought this was all great. He and Mrs. Schmo thought this was fabulous. Cut 14, go. And we know, Matt, there are still some Americans left in Afghanistan with one day left of these evacuations and many, many Afghans who would like to leave the country. What happens to them as this deadline is met, as President Biden has promised on the 31st, which is tomorrow? What happens on Wednesday, on September 1st, to those left behind? Yeah, uh, you know, I don't really know. Uh, And I've spoken with some young Afghans um, who were trying to get out. I actually spoke with a young woman last week. She was on a bus trying to get into the airport. She sat on that bus for about 10 hours. Uh, The Taliban came on and were looking around, inspecting everybody. It's tough because they have to get through the Taliban checkpoints. And in order to do that, they have to identify themselves to the Taliban. So if they no, 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 you don't understand. They had a practical reason. We had shared interests. We had to be pragmatic. Go ahead. Into the airport. If they don't get out of the country, then they have to return to Taliban occupied Kabul, uh, knowing that the Taliban has their names, their contact details, all their information. But where did they get their names, their contact, and all their information from, NBC? What did that? Such a tremendous success. We've never seen anything like this before. They have the name and contact numbers. Wow. They have the technology to, to look into somebody's eyes through various devices and so forth to know who they Where'd they get that from? We've never seen such success like this, have we, Mr. Producer? So they have names, they have contact numbers, they have information on these people now. Go ahead. And knows that they've been trying desperately to leave the country, so it's unclear what's going to happen to them. No, it's not. You said she's a young woman. It's very clear what's going to happen to her. She knows it, which is why she's trying to get out. But it's not botched, no, no. Nobody's stranded. Don't use the word stranded. We've been told. We've been admonished. No, no, no. This is the greatest, the greatest evacuation in world history. Look what we did. If you disagree, you're attacking the troops. No, I'm not attacking the troops. Oh, you must be. We have to be fair about this, you know. No, I'm attacking the decisions by the commander. chief No, 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 no. And they're working on a speech as we speak. And he's got to be practicing it tomorrow. That's why he never gives a speech at 9 in the morning. The word is the, not they. So they'll work it through. Again, I'll ask, does anybody know if an American citizen's been killed in Afghanistan any time during the last three weeks? I'm not talking about those three heroes, excuse me, 13 heroes, soldiers. I'm saying American citizen. No, nobody knows. Oh, and by the way, 
If you want to get out, you can still contact the State Department. Keep in touch with the State Department. Let me ask you folks a question. You ever have a problem with your iPhone? Any connection? Android? Have you, Mr. Producer? So let's say you're in a part of Afghanistan that's maybe not it's Kabul. Maybe it's part of the, the countryside. Think people are having trouble with their cell phones or their laptops? I think they might be, Mr. Producer, don't you? Yes, yes. I had trouble in New Jersey today. Just charge up your phone. Where are you going to charge it? Ah, just do it. Come on. You can just do it. You think the Taliban by now knows how to shut down electrical grids? And I think they do. John Carl, ABC's This Week, yesterday. Cut 15, go. Listening to President Biden and his top national security advisors before the horrible bombing, they were making this sound like a smashing success. But you heard what Secretary Blinken just said. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it is, uh, they have been describing something that it isn't reality. Uh, this has been an incredible airlift, more than 100,000 people evacuated, but what a disaster. Uh, clearly, Thursday was the worst day of the Biden presidency. Now, notice, as, as much as I, I agree with much of what he's saying, everything is defined by politics and the Biden presidency. 13 people are murdered. Americans. This is the worst day of the Biden presidency. Oh, I'm sorry. It is. It's where. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's the worst day of the Biden. Pre- oh, I'm sorry. Well then, that explains everything. Go ahead. We know, Martha. Uh, how bad it really is. Uh, we, we know the disaster that has unfolded. Now the big question is. Does Afghanistan once again become a safe haven for terrorist attacks on U.S. interests around the world? All or right. Not? You know, uh, I was just told the war is over. I'm all over TV. Are you watching the graphics, America? The war is over. Like it's the end of World War II. Where we dropped atomic bombs on uh, Japan. Where Berlin was, te- where, uh, where Hitler committed suicide. Where, yeah, it's like World War II. We surrendered. We surrendered. They're not done. The party that surrendered doesn't define if a war is over. And we use this word war when we have 2,500 men and women there who are non-combat. The war is finally over. And the war is not over. Oh, we have over the horizon, and we demonstrated that when we killed a few of these cockroaches the other day. What are their names? We're not telling you. Why? We're out now. What are their names? We're not telling you. Why? Because they're planners. You know why, ladies and gentlemen? I'll take a guess. If they actually hit the people who were involved in the specific attack that wound up killing scores of Afghans, among others, and our precious 13 troops. We'd know their name, their serial number, and we'd have their pictures. If they were the ones that were actually behind it. As soon as I heard this, I said to my wife, Julia, I said, how do they know they got these guys? We pulled all of our intelligence out of there. I don't think they do. Or presumably they would tell us, would they not? You watch how the narrative changes. The spinning is beginning. The corrupt media is going to jump in. You watch. My God. This is the most fantastic thing we've ever seen. Planes flying in and out every 14 seconds. We've never seen anything like this before. Because they are intentionally, they are intentionally overlaying the patriotism you have for our troops with the disastrous decisions that were made by the brass and the commander-in-chief and the secretary of state and the national security advisor because they are propagandists and they are brilliant at this and the media is going to switch on a dime. You watch. Do I owe you anything, Rich? 
Not a Hillsdale or anything? Well, then I want to hit one other thing. I got to watch the clock, but I'm really, I'm really focused on this. I'm really body and soul. But what else? What else? How else is this a magnificent success, ladies and gentlemen? They have $85 billion worth of our cutting-edge technology and equipment. Oh, yeah! Fantastic! Unbelievable success! We've never seen anything like this before! Oh, yeah! There's a whole chart out there. Thousands of Humvees. Dozens and dozens of Cobras. (coughs) Even jet fighters. I mean, my goodness. It's like the fifth biggest army on the face of the earth now, give or take. Now, while Biden and his Secretary of State and his Secretary of Defense, no doubt, and General McKenzie uh, think this has really been unbelievable. 5,000 terrorists were released from two prisons, including Al Qaeda and ISIS. 5,000. I've been saying, and now one of the hosts on cable TV regurgitated, I want to salute the host, they know what, what show to listen to. But the Taliban and ISIS hate each other. Really? Then why did they release them from prison? They have a common enemy, it's called us. But it was the greatest airlift in history. Greatest in history! Oh, okay. It shouldn't have been if this was handled properly, without deadlines, without confusion, without sending the military out first, before you send the citizens out. And when we come back, do you think China, Russia, Iran, think this is the greatest success ever? Oh, America has demonstrated to us, don't screw around with Commander Joe Biden. No, 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 no. Commander-in-Chief Joseph Robinette Biden, Jr., born in Scranton, Lunch Bucket Joe, a man of Wilmington, Delaware. Don't mess with him, boy, I'll tell you what. What a magnificent success. We've never seen anything like this. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. American history and civics education is at a turning point. Will we allow bureaucrats and lobbyists to choose what school children are taught, or will we teach the whole truth? Now, my friends at Hillsdale College argue for teaching the truth. They've made the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum downloadable for free at levinforhillsdale.com. Available not only to teachers, but also to citizens like you to share with other concerned citizens. This complete K-12 through history and civics curriculum, designed to give educators guidance, not mandates, Allow students to learn the tragedies and triumphs of American history as it really happened. Our children deserve to be taught the truth through a sound curriculum that was created by teachers, not bureaucrats, and upholds the dignity of each individual. America's future depends upon an honest, candid look at our history. Download Hillsdale's 1776 curriculum for free today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. The greatest surrender in world history. More people evacuated in that period of time than ever before. $85 billion of equipment. American citizens left behind. Allies left behind. 5,000 terrorists released from prison, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. Wow. What's communist China think? How about fascistic Russia? How about Islamo-Nazi Iran? What do they think? They think, oh my God, we're shaking in our boots now with Biden and his commanders. We've never seen anything like this before. That's the most historic surrender and evacuation we have ever seen. You know what our enemies want? More evacuations, just like that. So we get really, really good at it. They'd love to see us evacuate Europe, NATO. Oh, my God, look, they've evacuated. Oh, look at that. It's historic. We've never done it like that before. 
And with a deadline, can you imagine? Oh, yes. Is that what China thinks? Is that what Putin thinks? Is that what Iran thinks? Oh, and I failed to mention. Ever hear Pakistan? Or as normal people call it, Pakistan. Pakistan. About a third of it is terrorist controlled. Has a relatively corrupt military and a totally corrupt government. And nuclear warheads. Nuclear warheads. What do you think the terrorists would love to get their hands on? Huh? What do you think? We gave them everything we have, $85 billion worth. I love the anti-Semites in this country. You know, we'll, we'll support Israel with 2 or $3 billion in military equipment. And in exchange, we get their technology, we get their eyes and ears, we get them as a forward force against Iran. $3 billion, $2 billion, whatever it is. Wow, $85 billion to the Taliban. Can you imagine? Our cutting-edge technology is going right over to Beijing and Moscow, Tehran. The inbred in North Korea, they're all going to have it. They're all going to see it. What success meant success? Come on now. Fantastic. We've never seen anything like this before. You know who we haven't heard from, Mr. Producer, in America? Where are the American citizens who can't get out? How are they going to communicate with us? I don't want to hear from reporters who cover the Pentagon. I don't want to hear from reporters who cover the Star. Can we hear from one of the 250? No. Why? Because they're hiding for their lives and we have no way of contacting them. Our media are not there anymore. Oh. But the Secretary of State, he's going to come to the rescue. No, he's not. It'd be great to hear from one or two American citizens behind enemy lines now, wouldn't it, ladies and gentlemen? And now, what you're going to hear tomorrow, among other things, if not the Secretary of State of Confusion, is tough talk on the Taliban now. Now that the military's... Look, we're going to put it to these guys. We're really going to put it to them. I mean, I've got my toughest Assistant Secretary for International Affairs on this job, boy. Big lib, big Democrat, supports gun control, but he's a tough guy. You've never seen him in a room. He knows how to talk to talk. And who's going to back him up? Not the military. Oh, well. The Taliban, doesn't, don't they want to be part of the, the community of nations? Ever hear that one? Community of nations. They want to be part of the community of They're terrorists, you idiot. I'll be right back. Here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Clarissa Ward is a superb reporter, and she's at CNN. She's the only superb reporter they have at CNN. And you remember her. She was in Afghanistan, and they threatened her, the Taliban. And I asked you, what about these citizens? Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, is taking a victory lap. And he wants you to know how much he loves the United States military. But now it's all about diplomacy. So we're going to beat terrorists with diplomacy and the over-horizon Michigas. All right. Here she is with uh, Wolf Blitzer, CNN. This isn't that long ago, is it? No, it's uh, really a f- few minutes ago. Go ahead, Mr. Produce. How crushing do you think this moment is uh, for the, let's say, 250 Americans and so many others, thousands of Afghans uh, who were still desperate to try to get out? 
I think it's absolutely crushing. Of course, Wolf. I spoke earlier on in the day with a family of four from Houston, Texas. They told me they had been going to the airport for two weeks, trying desperately to get out. They all have American passports. They had gone to Afghanistan to visit the mother's family. And essentially, the issue was they couldn't get past the Taliban. They were in touch with the U.S. military. The military was trying to facilitate their departure. And literally a minute ago, Blinken, the Secretary of State, we said we gave Americans every chance to leave. You're now going to be overwhelmed with propaganda, with false narratives, coming out of Washington, D.C., coming out of the very people who massively bungled this. I can remember when if there were 52 citizens that a Islamo-Nazi nation or group we're holding, that that was very, very upsetting to the American people. Remember that, Mr. Producer, the Iranian regime? Well, it was day after day, day 400, day 401, day 402. What do you think the media will do today? You think they'll treat it like the virus where they have a chart and a number of days up there on the monitor every day? Day one, American hostages, citizens who can't get out of Afghanistan. Day two, day three, day four. You think we'll have that, America? No, 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 because it's Biden and Blinken and Sherman, whatever the hell that guy's name. I want you to hear this again. Go ahead. How crushing do you think this moment is uh, for the, let's say, 250 Americans and so many others, thousands of Afghans, uh, who were still desperate to try to get out. I think it's absolutely crushing. Of course, Wolf. I spoke earlier on in the day with a family of four from Houston, Texas. They told me they had been going to the airport for two weeks, trying desperately to get out. They all have American passports. They had gone to Afghanistan to visit the mother's family. And essentially, the issue was they couldn't get past the Taliban. They were in touch with the U.S. military. The military was trying to facilitate their departure. But now we have diplomacy. Now that the military is out of the way, Mr. Producer in America, now the Taliban will be much more persuadable, don't you think? And then Blinken says, we're going to hold the Taliban accountable. Ladies and gentlemen, this administration is so full of crap, it's pouring out of their eyes, their ears, and their nose. They are pathological liars. And they're not even good at it. They've been wrong for the past many weeks. They've talked out of both sides of their mouths. So is this President of the United States. He's mumbled out of both sides of his mouth. Gibberish from the left side to the right side of his mouth. They're going to hold the Taliban accountable, but without the military. Diplomatically, the whole world, the community of nations are going to come down on ISIS. And Al-Qaeda. And the Taliban. 5,000 terrorists released from the prisons. What a success. $85 billion in our equipment. Oh, we've never seen anything like this. But we got this evacuation thing really down now, except when it comes to 250 Americans. I bet the State Department got all their people out of there. Oh, I bet they did. I bet they did. I know that many Americans who wanted to get out couldn't get out. I got the texts from one particular individual whose daughter served in the Marines, was in touch with these people, was trying to get them out, desperately trying to get them out. There were several dozen of them. They got to the gate. They couldn't get through the gate. Why? Because the gate was was soldered shut. Is that the right phrase? And that's 36 hours ago. 36 hours ago. So the Secretary of State, we're not going to rely on the Taliban. We're going to really kick up diplomacy. We're going to hold them to account. Every American who wanted to get out had a chance to get out. Every single thing that pours out of this man's mouth is a friggin' lie. It's a damnable lie. 
That's hard to take. Now, how about we, we listen to a couple of heroes who actually fought in Afghanistan? As I said, my Sunday show was moved to 10 p.m. Eastern Time from 8 p.m. Eastern Time for coverage on the hurricane, which was a little odd, I thought, again, because actually the hurricane had kicked into higher gear, still is, later in the night, not earlier in the night. But I, I just can't, you know, I can't win. So they, they did what they wanted to do. What did Brian Mast have to say? He lost both. I love these. Uh, yeah, well, your kid's not in there. That's true. But Brian Mast was in there. And by the way, most of the people who say that have never been in there either. Ah, your kid wasn't in there. But Brian Mast was, and he lost both legs and a finger. He was on Life, Liberty, and Levin last night. If you didn't see it, cut 21, go. Look, I'm going to start out this way, Congressman. As you're looking at what's taking place now, what do you have to say to the President of the United States? This could have been avoided. And I would, uh, I would go back to this. I think President Reagan so often said things in, in a way better than, than any could. And he said this about the Beirut bombings. These deeds represent the bestial nature of those who wish to assume power. President Biden has handed the most intimidating, most effective military weaponry on the face of the earth to those bestial animals. Those animals that if you're not a Muslim jihadist willing to go out there and kill others with a beard that would extend beyond the length of your fist, if that is not who you are, then to them you are nothing more than livestock. And that is who you have handed the most sophisticated military weaponry. That is who you have allowed to encircle the United States of America. That, who, that, that is who you want now a participation trophy for sinking a ship and then saying, oh, you sent out lifeboats to everybody else. That's what you want a participation trophy for. That is not the fact of the situation. If anything, you should probably be brought up on no less than 10,000 charges of reckless endangerment for all of those Americans. Mm-hmm. Dan Crenshaw. He also fought. He was a deputy commander. And here's what he said on Life, Liberty, and Levin last night in part two. Let's go to cut 23. Go. I have a question for you, sir. Thanks, Mark. Uh, As we see what's unraveling, and we've seen what's been unraveling now for some time, the last couple of weeks here, what exactly was the Biden administration's mission here? It's a great question, and it it honestly gets to the heart of what we've been debating for 20 years in the United States. Uh, Since since the second day that we were in Afghanistan, because we all agreed there was no debate. We all agreed that we needed to go and we needed to to do something about 9-11 and and take it to the people who are responsible for this. But there's been a debate ever since about what do we do now. And it seems to me that the mission, according to Joe Biden, was simply get our troops home. That was the only mission. Now, that should never be the mission. Right. And again, this gets to the heart of the debate. The goal was never just to keep our entire military at home. That's not national defense. It's, it's not a bunch of Navy SEALs on the beaches just looking out over the horizon, waiting for the Ruskies to come. That's not national defense. National defense means being forward deployed, building alliances and and helping our partners uh, keep our country safe, because the world is an extremely small place and uh, terrorism travels rather quickly. This is a lesson that we we learned after 9-11, but appeared to have forgotten. So the mission can't just be bring troops home, but that was Joe Biden's mission, and he was singularly focused on that. His advisors told him something different. The military consistently told him something different. They they consistently gave the same advice they gave to President Trump and to President Obama. And look, President Trump and Obama wanted the same thing, but, but they had to deal with the reality of the situation, that there are extreme costs to just withdrawing everybody, even though that makes you feel good. And that seems to be the only strategic objective here was, was good feelings. It, feel, it makes us feel better if we have zero troops in Afghanistan. Well, I don't think we feel very good about it now, do we? And uh, the, the strategic objective, what it should be, is keep America safe. And then you do what it takes to keep America safe at the lowest cost possible. But in order to make that objective, 
And we've been struggling to find that balance for 20 years. Frankly, we had that balance since about 2014, since Obama transitioned us to a security assistance mission. We found that balance at a very low cost. We were keeping America safe and, and preventing a terrorist safe haven. You know, we hadn't lost a troop in, in 18 months, and we made this horrible blunder. Uh, well, I, I don't know about we, but we as a country did, and, and Joe Biden's leading that country. And uh, now we have now we have blood on our hands. That that's that's the reality of what's going on right now. No, 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 no. We evacuated 120 some thousand people. That is the victory. That is the history. And now we move to diplomacy. Don't worry about China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan. Don't worry about $85 billion worth of equipment in the wrong hands, the release of 5,000 terrorists from prisons. Don't worry about any of this stuff. No, 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 no. It was a brilliantly executed plan. Military out first. Most citizens out, we think, second. Some stay. Look, we told them to get out. We did everything we could. They just wouldn't listen. This, ladies and gentlemen, is cutting-edge military strategy. Cutting edge. That will be embraced for the rest of time by the great militaries to follow us. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Over 2,000 of you, my listeners, made the switch from overpriced wireless carriers to Pure Talk over the past few months. We want the rest of you to join us and to see what we're talking about. If you're with AT&T and Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching to Pure Talk. You get great coverage, you can keep your phone and your number, and you'll save a fortune. Pure Talk is the top-rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs with the absolute best consumer service team based right here in America. Does that sound good? Well, it gets better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data, just $30 a month. And if you go over on data, they don't charge you for it. They don't care. Go to puretalkusa.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. Again, puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin, L-E-V-I-N Podcast. And when you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. That's puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin Podcast. Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. The Taliban can earn... Legitimacy, ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the State of Confusion proclaimed a few minutes ago. They can earn legitimacy. I'm telling you now, these people are going to get more Americans killed. They already got 13 of them killed, and God knows what's going to happen behind the uh, enemy lines now. God knows. And um, the last flights out of Afghanistan. Were there any American citizens on those flights? Cut 26, go. Can you give us a sense of whether or not there were any American citizens or other civilians who were taken out on any of those last couple of C-17s that flew out this uh, this afternoon? And can you give us a picture of what you saw uh, with equipment and other things getting either destroyed or removed at the airport. Now she's asking this of General McKenzie, who was really in charge of all the uh, hands-on aspects of this. And probably handed a very bad deck, but nonetheless. Go ahead. So we no, no American citizens came out on the last, what we call the joint tactical exfiltration, the last uh, five jets to leave. So the last five jets to leave, not a single American was on it. What do you think of that? In other words, citizen, private citizen. What do you think of that? Those are big damn planes. We used to call them C-17s. They now call them C-17s. What do you think of that? You think Reagan would have done that? You think Eisenhower would have done that? You think Trump would have done that? 
If Theodore Roosevelt were alive today, you think he would have done that? No, I don't think so. So the mission was a success, and damn if I can't understand what the mission was. To get our troops out. So we sent in six, 7,000 troops to get our troops out. Then all hell broke loose, and it turned into an evacuation. But it was all a surrender. And what's amazing, so you know, Washington is beaming and excited tonight. The Secretary of State gives a speech, I can tell you, when he walks back into the, into the whatever rooms they have back there. They're patting him on the back. They're applauding him. Same with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Same with the Secretary. We did it. We did it. We did it. You did what? Well, the Taliban were very helpful, you know. They took the damn country. <laughs> they took $85 billion of our equipment. Maybe that's why they were helpful, quote-unquote, Mr. Producer. And yet you just heard this story on CNN. On CNN. With a reporter who's been reporting from Afghanistan, even when it was horrendous. You know, the reporters who stayed there near the end. Her, the guy on Fox, I can't remember his name. What is his name? The guy, the report, what is it? Trey Yinks. He's really stepped up, quite frankly. They're both saying, uh, hold on, there's American citizens there. People who wanted to get out couldn't get out. They're giving a contrary factual explanation to what you're hearing from Washington. From what you're hearing from Washington. And they're treating the Taliban like, I, I, folks, I just, uh, I'm trying to use as much logic as I could muster. I'm trying to do the audio for you, pull that together. I'm trying to explain the irrationality of what's happened here and what's going on here. It's just appalling. Absolutely appalling. The enemy is much stronger than it was 20 years ago now. China's much stronger than it was. It's on the rise. Russia's much stronger than it was. It's on the rise. The Islamo-Nazi regime in Tehran, the fool who's the the phony Prime Minister of Israel and the coalition government. He's moved left. They're going to give half a billion dollars to the Palestinians. Gee, I wonder what they'll do with that. This is the Israelis. They said they won't publicly oppose Biden getting back into a deal with the Iranians. I mean, that clown's surrendering his whole country. Oh, we've got to get rid of this Netanyahu. You know? He's been in there too long. The world would be a different place with Trump and Netanyahu. This much I know. I'll be right back. is right versus wrong. Call Mark at 877-381-3811. All right. There's two areas in which uh, some of us may have uh, disagreements. I'm not sure why exactly. But there is an isolationist movement within the Republican Party and even beyond the Republican Party, that says, let's just withdraw all our f- most of our forward bases, our forward uh, military resources. Why are we 7,000 miles away, 9,000 miles away? And the reason, of course, is we've never been hit from Lawrence, Kansas. Isn't that amazing, Mr. Producer? We've never been hit from Lawrence, Kansas. Because the enemy, when it comes to war, is overseas somewhere. Now, we have enemies within, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about actual war. So I felt 2,500 non-combat troops, and I've changed my mind about this over time, but I felt 2,500 non-combat troops, the Bagram Airport, air base, impenetrable. I did some research on that base. It was originally built by Eisenhower. 
It was muscled up by the Soviets, and then we added another $800 million to it. it. It's a fantastic base. It's massive. And it gave us access to an, in, an intel information into China and into Russia, as well as Pakistan. And we gave it up. Just gave it up. But I felt things were pretty neutralized in Afghanistan under the circumstances. We didn't need to send in 50,000 troops like Biden. Said, well, you send a billion in order. No, not really. In fact, not at all. So I opposed this period. And even President Trump, and I've talked to President Trump since, said if they had started taking provincial capitals like this, he would have bombed the S out of them. That's what he told me. And that there were triggers throughout that agreement. He's a very sharp man. He knows what was in the agreement. And he's right. And we've talked about this. In other words, the agreement wasn't even in place anymore. Because in addition to what I just said, the Taliban was supposed to negotiate with the Afghan government, which it never did. Plus, you pull out the military before the citizens and so forth. And that's because Biden was paranoid. He had a hate on for the military. Tomorrow, I'll tell you how much he loves the military, but he doesn't love the military. And he thought the military was rolling Obama, that it had rolled Bush, that it had rolled Trump, and he wasn't going to allow it. So he was going to pull out the military before the citizens. This was his, this is in his mind, such as it is. So that's number one. I never thought this was, well, at one point I did several years ago, but in the last 18 or two months, 18 months or two years, Mr. Producer will tell you too, I never thought it was a good idea. And you can go back and check. It doesn't matter. Number two. Afghans were properly vetted to make sure that the enemy hasn't secreted themselves in these planes among the population of the hundred and so thousand. And we're not taking all of them, but we're taking a lot. And if we can sh- they can show that they assisted us during the war, we should welcome them with open arms. Well, Mark, you must favor him. No, I don't. I favor securing the southern border. There are immigrants and there are immigrants. And under federal law, there's distinction between different types of immigrants. If you have actual refugees, and in this case, it's even more than that. If you have actual partners in war who were assisting us to fight the enemy who attacked us in New York and attacked us in Virginia and attacked us in central Pennsylvania... You don't throw people like that overboard. These people are better citizens than most leftists in this country. We've had them call my show. They should be embraced. And by the way, I suspect their politics eventually would be much like immigrants from Cuba or Venezuela and so forth who tend to vote Republican. But that aside, that aside, If you fought next to one of our Marines, one of our Rangers, you fought next to our infantry, you assisted us at the various air bases we had and so forth and so on, as far as I'm concerned, you're a brother and a sister. And I embrace you. Folks, they fought fundamentalist Islam. They fought it. They didn't embrace it. They fought it. These people aren't going to join groups like CARE. They're the Zudi Jassers of the world. In my opinion. In my opinion. You know, out of respect for the events that have taken place, I haven't talked about this much in the last several days. But I want to talk about it now. I'm already getting contacted by parents and so forth about what's going on in their school systems. Here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Board of Education, the State Board of Education, is is really packed with a bunch of psychopaths. And starting in kindergarten, they want to teach them about, well, basically transitioning. Now, I'm not going to do this for the rest of my life, but I want to encourage you strongly to get your copies of American Marxism. The academic year is beginning. 
Labor Day weekend, I think is this weekend, right, Mr. Reduce? I want to strongly encourage you to jump in if you haven't, and if you have, and if you're able to, I want you to help other people to participate by getting them a copy of American Marxism. It's $16.80 on Amazon.com. It'll be delivered to your home in the next day or two, or to their home in the next day or two. I have done that. I've sent it to a number of people by going on Amazon. Yes, I pay the, the freight, too. Uh, if you call in, you get freebies, but that's really the only way. <laughs> Even I have to pay. But I don't care. That's not the point. The point is the message is crucially important. I, I haven't looked at Amazon in a while, Mr. Bredo. I think we have like 10,000 comments on there now. That's remarkable for a book. The other day, the president sent me a note, congratulated me. The president, Donald Trump. He thought that's great, too. But I really want you to encourage you. There's been a lot going on the last few weeks. And we've got to keep our eye on all these things. Because the American Marxists never stops. They're going to strike on the budget. They're going to strike on classrooms. I meaning strike out. Attack. Uh, the border's still wide open. These things are not going away. These things are not going away. And we need your help now more than ever. We cannot allow the media to change the narrative. We cannot allow the media to distract us. I, wasn't do- I didn't do a lot of TV last week. And the TV I did, I said to myself, no, I'm not promoting the book. We still have men in uniform in Afghanistan. They were hit on Thursday, the men and women, and I'm not going to do it. But I want to encourage you to do what you can. If you can go to Amazon.com right now and order it for yourself, for your family member, particularly college or a high school student or somebody else, it would be a great time to do it. I will tell you, Costco's got them all lined up there. They're doing a great job. Barnes & Noble, Walmart, all the stores doing a great job. It just requires you to participate. And I'm going to give you a little secret little secret as of the end of Saturday although I may have blurted this out already according to the numbers that are my publisher we've reached the 900,000 mark and I've said if we get to a million then I know we have our army there's plenty of things to do plenty of things to do to help save this country from within American Marxism at Amazon.com I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Over 2,000 of you, my listeners, made the switch from overpriced wireless carriers to Pure Talk over the past few months. We want the rest of you to join us and to see what we're talking about. If you're with AT&T and Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching to Pure Talk. You get great coverage, you can keep your phone and your number, and you'll save a fortune. Pure Talk is the top-rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs, with the absolute best consumer service team, based right here in America. Does that sound good? Well, it gets better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data, just $30 a month. And if you go over on data, they don't charge you for it. They don't care. Go to puretalkusa.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. Again, puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin, L E V I N Podcast. And when you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. That's puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin Podcast. Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. I want General McKenzie to understand something, and their spokesman, their mouthpiece, this guy, Admiral Kirby. You, under this commander-in-chief, have incited likely more terrorist attacks because our enemies think they won. They know they won. 
So while you keep trying to convince the American people and your media slobs will do the same thing, that this has been fantastic, our enemies know better. And the more you lie to the American people and the more you spin and spit out your propaganda at the Washington Compost, the New York Slimes, and all the rest of you, the less prepared the American people will be when it comes. That's the truth. And on top of all the rest of it, Americans still left over there? You heard the CNN reporter, the CNN reporter, talk about a family, a Texas family, Ford, for two weeks tried to get into the compound, could not, and has been left there? The American Humane condemns death sentence delivered to contract working dogs left behind in Kabul. You know, the Islamo-Nazis hate dogs. They kill them left and right. They treat women like dogs and do the same to them. Dr. Robin Genzert, President CEO of American Humane, the country's first national humane organization, they write, released the following statement. I'm devastated by reports that the American government is pulling out of Kabul, leaving behind brave U.S. military contract working dogs to be tortured and killed at the hands of the enemies. These brave dogs do the same dangerous, life-saving work and deserved a far better fate than the one to which they have been condemned. Humane, American Humane has worked hand-in-hand hand with the military for more than 100 years to rescue military animals. In fact, our famed rescue program began on the bloody battlefields of World War I Europe at the request of the U.S. Secretary of War. Since that time, we served as a pioneer in the development of animal therapy for returning veterans. Today, brings home retired military working dogs and pairs veterans with life-saving service dogs. You ever see the veterans trying to get these dogs out, the bomb-sniffing dogs and so forth, this group helps them do it. Irrespective of the outcome, this gross oversight of justice must be stopped from happening. To that end, we call on Congress to take action. All right. Now, this may say, what are the dogs? What about human beings? What about both? Let's go to Elaine. Rockland, New York, that great WABC. Elaine, go right ahead, please. Yep. Hi, Mr. Levin. It's an honor to speak with you. How are thank you this you. evening? Good. How are you? Well, I'm good, thank you. So I, I have a few questions. I would like to know how this can be considered a success. We gave the Afghanistan National Security Black Hawk helicopters in June because they asked for them. Now the Taliban have them. Whose bright idea was that? They, they, our military knew there was, it was going to be a risk, but yet they gave it to them. And how can we believe that there but, are... But even more than that, we snuck out in the middle of the night. We didn't have to sneak out in the middle of the night. We could have taken more time and removed our equipment. Exactly. But we didn't. We didn't. So, no, we didn't. Exactly. And how can we believe... No. And how can we believe that there are 250 American, Americans left behind? We can't yeah, isn't it amazing? 250. Them. Not 257 or 311 or 241. Exactly 250. Have you noticed that? And, and exactly. And about 15, 20 minutes ago, I heard, oh, there's only about 100. Only? Or are oh, yeah. 20? They'll all be out in about uh, 14 minutes. Elaine, don't hang up. I want to send you a signed copy of American Marxism, and I'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, this final hour of the podcast is sponsored exclusively by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we care about, faith, family, and freedom. Thank you for listening, and please support AMAC. And you can become a member at amac.us slash join. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877 from Blaze Media News, American University have, of Afghanistan students terrified after being told they can't evacuate and their names have been given to the Taliban. Anybody who wanted to get out could get out. That's what the Secretary of State just said. 
45 minutes ago. Hundreds of students at the American University of Afghanistan had been left terrified for their lives after being denied evacuation from Kabul and told that the U.S. government gave their names to the Taliban. In a stunning report published Sunday, the New York Slimes relayed that roughly 600 students, staff, and their relatives had been left stranded in a safe house in Kabul amid the Taliban's violent takeover of the country, their hopes of evacuation dashed. So let's assume 600 of them are citizens. Or dual citizens. Isn't 600 more than 250, Mr. Reducer? I think it is, ladies and gentlemen. The group reportedly boarded buses set for Hamid Karzai International Airport on Sunday in a final attempt to flee the country, but after seven hours of waiting for clearance, the group was told to turn around. The airport remained a security threat, and civilian evacuations were to be halted permanently on Monday, which they were. I regret to inform you that the high command at HKKIA, that would be the airport, has announced there will be no more rescue flights. Imagine getting that email from American University President Ian Pickford Sunday afternoon. The scholar pilgrims who were turned away today while seeking safe passage to a better future need the help of the U.S. government, who gave them the hope they must not lose, Pickford added. While being instructed to return home, the defeated group received even worse news. Their names had been shared with the Taliban by the United States government. Oh, wow. They told us, we've given your names to the Taliban, recounted Jose, a 24-year-old sophomore who was aboard the bus on Sunday. We're all terrified. There's no evacuation. There's no getting out. Our hopes and dreams have turned into dust. Critics blasted the Biden administration. Amid reports, U.S. officials had carelessly supplied the Taliban with a list of names of U.S. citizens, green card holders, and Afghan allies in an effort to expedite their entry to the Kabul airport. No, says the Secretary of State today, never happened. It did happen. Meanwhile, the Taliban's promises of tolerance and leniency in the new regime have been coupled with violence against all who associated with Western governments and organizations during the last 20 years. And you want to see the examples? They're all over the place. Here's again the blaze from August 20th. Taliban fighters are hunting down journalists, carrying out revenge executions against Afghans who work with the West. It's going on all over that country. And you know what? It's going on at warp speed now that we're out. I don't believe there's 250 American citizens in enemy territory. I believe there's hundreds more, if not thousands. I don't know that. But I believe it. Now, our buddy Andrew Wilkow, who's part of the Blaze, as well as Sirius Satellite Radio, excellent show, he spoke to the mother of fallen Marine Riley McCullum on Sirius XM on Friday. On Friday, the day after this horrific mass killing of American soldiers as well as uh, scores of Afghans. This is going to be tough to listen to. But listen, we should and must. Cut 17, go. My son was one of the Marines that died yesterday. I had to listen to that. Sorry, I'm on the radio. No, 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 no. Um, go, go My ahead. son uh, was one of the Marines that died yesterday. 20 years and six months old, getting ready to come home from freaking Jordan to be with his wife to watch the birth of his son. And that feckless, dementia-ridden piece of crap just sent my son to die. I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning to Marines at my door telling me my son was dead. So to have her on right before me and listen to that piece of crap, talk about diplomatic crap with freaking Taliban terrorists who just freaking blew up my son and no nothing to not say anything about oh my god I'm so sorry for the families so my son is gone 
And I just want all you Democrats who cheated in the election or who voted for him legitimately, you just killed my son. With a dementia-ridden piece of crap who doesn't even know he's in the White House, he still thinks he's a senator. So I'm going to try and calm down. I'm sorry. And she'll have to live with that the rest of her life. What happened to her son? Go ahead, go ahead and look up Riley McCullum. See her beautiful son. Who had a wife, was expecting a baby. Look up the others. Look at the two beautiful women. Young ladies. I think of my daughter, my stepdaughter. I mean, I can't even imagine how they died with an explosion so big. And you saw some of the video on TV of the street. But ISIS, they tell us, is different than the Taliban. You understand. Al-Qaeda hit us on 9-11, but Al-Qaeda is aligned with the Taliban, which is different than ISIS. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Washington bullcrap. Washington bullcrap. That's what it is. The former vice president of Afghanistan, with others, has formed a resistance in northern Afghanistan. I understand people want to focus on the former president of Afghanistan, who's corrupt. But the vice president the former vice president who's now officially under their constitution, the president. He's not corrupt. He's a fighter. And a resistance is building in northern Afghanistan, and the Biden administration won't even take their phone call. Won't even take their phone call. And yet people say the Afghans won't fight. I told you before, in seven years' time, 50,000 of them died, and they weren't all shot in the back. They died fighting. Ask Joey Jones. Ask Dan Crenshaw. Ask Brian Mast. Ask all of these Americans. Ask retired Colonel Richard Kemp, commander of British forces. They fought the Afghans. They fought to the death, especially their special forces. But when under Biden, the greatest military on the face of the earth, leaves under cover of dark, the Bagrain Air Force, which means they'll have no backup, pulls out the CIA intel, pulls out the contractors, the American contractors maintaining their helicopters and so forth, does it without even talking to that government or military to military. The Afghan military knew it was over. They knew it was over. We didn't build up that country. We didn't build it up simply because we wanted to help the Afghans. We built it up to help us. We built it up to help us. You know, there was a time where we did create democracies. You may recall, those of you who weren't alive, most of us, but you may be able to read about it, after World War II, we had something called the Marshall Plan. We had bombed most of these countries to smithereens. And then we built them back up with enormous economic aid. We helped set up their constitutions. We did the same with Japan and some other countries. And it worked. It can't work in Afghanistan. This we now know, right? In other parts of the world. Because every country is not the same. Every region is not the same. But we have done it before. And it has worked before. But that wasn't the mission here. The mission here was to protect us from another 9-11. And so now that the Taliban control the entire country... While Biden and his supporters and the isolationists want you to believe, no, 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 they're not all the same. Uh, They're the same. They all hate us. 
ISIS didn't hit us on 9-11. Al-Qaeda did. Al-Qaeda was working with the Taliban and protected by the Taliban. I wonder how all the cops in New York and the firefighters and emergency personnel and all the families affected by 9-11 feel today. Isn't it interesting? I haven't seen any of them interviewed. None of them. None of them. What do they think about using diplomacy with the Taliban, which is aligned with al-Qaeda? I wonder if they think that'll work. And again, I wish to remind... We weren't at war with Afghanistan or anybody in Afghanistan prior to getting hit. They were unprovoked. Absolutely unprovoked. But now the war is over, ladies and gentlemen. Now, how does that make any sense? The same people who say that now say Afghanistan's more dangerous than ever before. So the war's over. What do we do? We pack it in, we pretend it doesn't exist. We're not at war with Iran, technically. Should we ignore them too? I mean, technically right now, we're not at war with anybody, right? So why build up our defenses at all? Anyway, that, that woman, you got to... And you know what? It probably hasn't even fully sunk in. It takes time. Sometimes. You expect your son to walk in the front door. Okay, he's gone a few days, a few weeks, even a month. He's deployed. And then he never shows up. That poor woman's going to suffer horribly. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead, A-M-A-C dot U-S. John Alexandria, Virginia, the great WMAL. John, go right ahead, please. Hey, good evening, sir. It's an honor to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Uh, first Thank of you. all, it's very hard to follow that phone call for sure. Yeah. Um, I retired um, just a few months ago. After talk right into the mouth, please, please. And... Hold on now. I can't understand. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Now no, you got to, okay. if you're on a speaker or whatever, Bluetooth, put it in, you know, hold the phone in your hand. Okay. Is it? I am. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay, good. Yep. So I just retired after over 30 years uh, being a soldier, and I worked for General Milley um, mm-hmm. years ago when he was a colonel. And the first thing I would say is, uh, back in those days, he would have not said, I want to understand white rage. He would have said, I want, you're going to see white rage. Um, uh, but when you have the opportunity to talk to him and question him, I have a few questions that I think he should be asked. Uh, oh, he'll never come on this program. But go right ahead. Ask your questions. I, I was being I was being facetious. So first oh. of all, you know, one of the, he, he's been in the army for more than a day or two, and so everybody knows that we say we train to standard, not to time. So he needs to be asked why, um, in this case, we train to time and not to standard. Um, second of all, now wait a minute. That's closely, interesting. Say that again. In the in the military, we say that we train to standard, not to. Uh, this will make it simple, like taking care of your, like cleaning your room or, or doing chores around the house. You in other words, it's a mission oriented requir- mission oriented. Yes, sir. Exactly. Not time. We don't say you don't. We don't set a deadline. Uh, we set a deadline. We set suspenses, but the job still has to be done, even if you miss the suspense. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the second que- or the second thing is, if you listen when when he answered the question at the at the hearing um, about Bagram, uh, first of all, I believe that that question was directed to the secretary and not to General Milley. It was, and he stepped in. That's right. I think he was protecting the secretary and the president because he. And if you notice, he didn't say my recommendation was give up Bagram. He said Bagram. He said is not. It is not needed for the tactical and operational requirements that we have right now. First of mm-hmm. all, I didn't say anything about strategic. Second of all, um, the question that was not asked is, well, General Milley, what was your recommendation to um, the president as to whether we should hold on to Bagram or not? And then if your recommendation is to let go of it or to let it go, how do you justify that from the military standpoint, especially considering, you know, I, I don't even think we're – you can argue we're using the retrospectoscope now, but in fact – I think that's a reasonable question to ask um, uh, regardless. Um, and then finally... But let me just um, ask you that, you know, this General Milley had no problem jumping up in front of a microphone attacking Trump after Trump uh, walked through Lafayette Park. And that seems uh, really kind of trite to be uh, complaining about that when you consider what's going on here. Sir, I, com- I, com- I completely agree. I-, I didn't think that there was anything wrong with what he did. Um, to be honest with you, I mean that was a show of that was a show of unity and, um, uh, for lack of a better term, force. Oh, well, let me ask you this before we run out of time: How did you find you 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 worked with him? You reported to him when he was a colonel. How did you find him to be as a colonel? Um, he's he's bright, uh, bright, um, well read, and very very demanding, um, and very very. Um, uh, you, you don't you don't have any question about what he thinks, or at least back then you didn't. Now I think that has changed dramatically. I, he's not he's not the same he's not the same leader he was back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and real quick, I know we're out of time. The last question I would ask him that I, I really honestly can't believe nobody's asked him so far is um, how what his advice to the secretary. I'm sorry, the uh, president was with respect to leaving all of that equipment in Afghanistan. I, I cannot believe that that we actually allowed that to happen, not even not even one M4, much less the billions of dollars worth of equipment they were actually left. Well, thank you for your service, John. We very much appreciate it. God bless you. Take care of yourself. Oh, wait a minute. Don't hang up. All right, let's get him a... He deserves a signed copy of American Marxism, please. Um, so you heard from Kathy McCullum, who lost her son, Riley. And when we come back, I want you to hear from from uh, Darren Hoover, the father of fallen Marine Staff Sergeant Taylor Hoover, uh, this morning. And uh, these people are suffering. Now, one thing I will not do is start contacting parents and family members of fallen soldiers, not in their time of uh, grief. And... Uh, God knows I wouldn't want to be contacted. You know, I feel very, very sorry that Joe Biden lost his son, Bo. Bo, who served in the military, by all accounts, was a really solid, stand-up young man. And I know his, sec- his spokesman keeps bringing it up and others keep bringing it up. I understand that. Bo passed away from brain cancer, which is horrific. Absolutely Horrific. But not in combat. I just want to point that out. I think it's an important point if they're going to bring them up in these circumstances. I'll be back. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at AMAC.us. 
That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. The new American revolution starts here. The Mark Levin Show. Call in at 877-381-3811. I just got a nice note from uh, President Trump having nothing to do with any of this. So I will post it on at Mark Levin Show Getter, G-E-T-T-R, right, Mr. Producer? And uh, at Mark Levin Show Parlor. They ever fix that? Still working on it. No. Tell them to take it away from the intern and give it to an IT guy. Anyway... At Mark Levin Show Getter, G-E-T-T-R, at Mark Levin Show Parlor, I will post his little note so you can take a look at it, if you like. All right. Is Bernie Sanders a bigot? Is he a white racist, a white supremacist? I ask this question. Because he's cutting an ad for Governor Newsom against an African-American, you may have heard of him, named Larry Elder. And he's busy lying about this African-American, is Bernie Sanders. And so I think the fair question is, is Bernie Sanders a white supremacist? Hello, Bernie. Bernie or B.S. Sanders. B.S., just like Brian Stelter. Why do all the schmucks with the B.S.? Well, anyway, that's that's another story. Let's take a listen. Cut 18, go. At this unprecedented moment in American history, when we're trying to address the crisis of climate change, guarantee health care for all, and pass real immigration reform, the last hey, thing we... Hey, 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 I can't believe anybody even listens to me. When I grew up in New York, I used to stand on a soapbox and yell at the top of my lungs and nobody would listen to me. I used to wear a raincoat and offer people cigarettes just to listen to what I was saying. Nobody would listen. So I moved to Vermont. I moved to Vermont, where I I don't even think there are people of color in Vermont. Just a few, really, but I moved to Vermont. I thought about Martha's Vineyard, but I moved to Vermont. And there I was. I win the election. And I win a... I become mayor. Can you believe that? I become mayor. Along the way, I make a couple million... But I'm the mayor of Vermont. Believe it or not, I run for the Senate, I get elected. I get elected. Me, Bernie Sanders, an old commie. I call myself a democratic socialist. Climate change, climate change. Oh, yeah, climate change. That's the ticket. All right, start from the top. Now, look, he's attacking Larry Elder, which... Which means he's a bigot. He's a white supremacist. Isn't it amazing? Only people of color they agree with are worthy. Otherwise, they're right-wingers, they're no good, they're this or that, and the rest of it. If you read American Marxism, you'll understand the whole schmear. It is. Go ahead. At this unprecedented moment in American history, when we're trying to address the crisis of climate change, guarantee health care for all and pass real immigration How do you guarantee health care for all? How do you guarantee health care for all? How does that work? Seriously. Where does it work? So everybody has a right to see a doctor for free. Do you have a right to see a doctor whenever you want? Whenever you want. Who pays the doctor? The government? Yeah. Well, why would somebody go to college and then medical school, then residency, and all the rest, to be paid what a postal worker is paid. Why would they do that? And I'm nothing against postal workers, by the way. They're some of the nicest people I know. I'm quite serious. But so, why would anybody... And this guy, this guy, uh, he doesn't know how to do anything. That he knows how to run everything. But what, is, what does it mean, free uh, uh, health care for all? Do they have health care for all in the VA? Any time a vet walks in, he gets whatever he wants, or she gets? Of course not. Well, what does that mean? You have access to every drug? Of course not. Free health care. They have it in Cuba. 
you know, they have it in every fascistic Marxist regime. Oh, free health care, good. But bring your own toilet paper. Why? Uh, we don't have any toilet paper. You have any syringes? No. You have any, uh, you have any, uh, any medicine? No. You have any food here for lunch? No. Bring your own toilet paper. Go ahead. The last thing we need is to have some right-wing Republican government. Oh, look how he dehumanizes Larry Elder, an African-American. Look how he dehumanizes some right-wing Republican governor in California. Some right-wing... Excuse me. Excuse me. Are you a Klansman? Are you a neo-Nazi? What are you, Bernie Sanders? What are you? It's a white supremacist. Vermont is a, obviously a white-dominant society, wouldn't you say? Much like Martha's Vineyard, where Obama likes to go. Go ahead. The September 14th recall of Governor Newsom is a bold-faced Republican power grab. But he lies, see? Not only does he talk with cotton and marbles in his mouth, it's a bold-faced Republican power grab. Uh, no, no, a lot of Democrats and independents signed this petition. But, but, but I can say it. But, 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 but. Go ahead. Let it happen. Please, return your ballot or vote no in person by September 14th. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Another feeble, disgusting, pathetic, hate American jerk. Jerk. Now I want you to listen to something important. We played the mother of one of the, the murdered American soldiers from the Wilkow show. Now I'd like you to listen to a father, Darren Hoover, who was on Fox and Friends with Ainsley Earhart. Cut 16, go. How are you doing? How's your family? We're getting through it. Um, you know, no parent should have to bury their sons or daughters. It doesn't work. It's not supposed to work that way. And here I am. Here his mom is. Here his sisters are. And their husbands as well. As well as, as grandparents and aunts, uncles, cousins. And he's got two nieces as well. Mm. That, uh, that are only going to grow up knowing him by what we tell them and what, what they'll be able to see just from the, the pictures and stuff that we have. So they'll know that their uncle is a hero. Did did you have an opportunity to talk to him recently? Uh, I did. I talked to him before he left, um, and we talked again. You know, it's been approximately a month, month and a half ago, um, while he was stationed over there, um, and he was upbeat. He was happy. Um, just. Very positive about what was going on. When was his tour supposed to end? He was supposed to be home September 15th. My God. Good Lord. You know, I've said it, but I want to underscore this point. Talk about a white supremacist nation, a white dominant country, and Joe Biden was leading the charge. Systemic racism, the military, we need to check their social sites. They need to be part of critical race theory. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had Milley in a humiliatingly absurd appearance on Capitol Hill. Plays into all of this. Promotes all of it. Promotes all of it. They use our military to social engineer. You have sex change operations. You have ideology being pushed. And the Democrats and Biden have sided with all of it against the military. Something horrific like this happens. Have you noticed... There's a little respite from all this. We don't hear about that. About our military. But they will be back. It's like we used to talk about the NYPD. 
and the New York Fire Department and so forth with tremendous respect, honor. Now look. 9-11 happens, who do we rely on? Them. In Afghanistan, who do we rely on? Our military. The point is, when these horrors occur, it comes to light. But when they don't occur, these are the same men and women who deserve our respect. The same men and women. This commander-in-chief trashed our military. Trashed law enforcement. Trashed them. His budget basically freezes the defense budget as our men and women in uniform are expected and demanded to do more and more. He's undermined our police all over the country. All over the country. The border's still wide open. It's still wide, wide open. Another grave danger. But he doesn't care. He's a heartless, soulless, nasty old man. That's what he is. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. All right, if you go to uh, at Mark Levin Getter, at Mark Levin, G-E-T-T-R, you will see Mark Levin Show Getter, sorry. Mark Levin, L-E-V-I-N, Show Getter, G-E-T-T-R. You'll see the note President Trump sent me. Or go to at Mark Levin Show Parlor, same thing. The reason I've spent maybe 70% of the show getting into the particulars in unraveling the Afghanistan matter is because you're going to be bombarded and be frustrated and angry with what you're going to see and hear from the media. So uh, just hang in there, be tough, and don't allow yourself to be uh, influenced by them in any respect. Let's go to Dave, Jackson, Wyoming, on XM Satellite. Dave, how are you, sir? Mark? Fantastic to uh, get through on your show. Uh, you know, you're a true patriot, and uh, I consider myself one as well. Uh, today, uh, very, very moving moment. Uh, I was driving through town. I didn't even know about it, but uh, it turns out that there was a, uh, a police-led escort to uh, Jackson, Wyoming, uh, to honor Riley McCollum. And I pulled over, and I... I, I instantly knew what was going on, but I have never seen so many American flags. And, I mean, you want to talk about just right to the gut. It just, it just hit home. And I pulled over and I got out, and it was uh, – when the procession came through, it was just amazing to see all the flags just held up high. Mm-hmm. Uh, hard to hold back uh, tears, and uh, it's just absolutely amazing. And uh, – uh, I just I, I hope that the other families uh, that went through that had a similar experience in their hometown to honor their uh, their the fallen. Do you know his family? Uh, my son went to high school with uh, Riley. Uh, he was a year older. Riley was, but uh, um, 
I didn't know the family very well uh, uh-huh. by any means, but it was just, uh, you know, I think that it's just, uh, I just hope that other people shared, uh, you know, there was a tribute. Uh, and obviously there's been so many people that have fallen over the years. Uh, it's not just, you know, lately, but this was a tough one. And, I understand uh, completely. Way I, uh, it was just, uh, I mean,